That's all right for you. That's all right, no mama. Any way you do, but that's all right. This year's winner of the Iris Prize. Congratulations. Wow, that's, that's quite overwhelming. <laughs> Head to our website, then click on Festival. This is where you'll find and watch all of this year's films. Hello, welcome to the Iris Podcast. This year, we're all about Best of British. And welcome to opening night of the 14th Iris Prize LGBT Plus Film Festival. For nearly two decades, Emmanuel Anyamosigwe's obsession with diversity has won the hearts and minds of filmmakers and audiences alike. His blueprint for how minorities should be represented has stood the test of time, long before the penny dropped for other institutions far and wide that diversity truly matters. This year, as Buff marks its 15th anniversary, the more things change, the more things stay the same. Never has diversity been more relevant than in 2020. And as long as the issue remains in the public eye, Emmanuel has ensured that for creatives everywhere, the British Urban Film Festival is a broad church that welcomes all creeds and all colors, comfortable in its own skin and bold in its approach to storytelling and showcasing film as seen through the social and cultural lens. From BFM to Buckingham Palace, it's been quite a journey for the man who literally bet the house on making Buff the success that it is today.
Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever the case may be. Welcome one and all to the opening event of this year's British Urban Film Festival, finally. And this is the In Conversation with the Chair of BAFTA, Krishnendu Majumda, and the BAFTA Film Awards Committee Chair, Mark Samuelson. Good afternoon, both. Afternoon. Hello. Hello. Right, so let's kick things off with a curveball question. Um, nothing too strenuous, but I, I, I guess with everything that's happened this year, I was keen to ask the both of you, what was the last film you actually saw in the cinema? Chris? Uh, I saw uh, Riz Ahmed's film a few weeks ago. Uh, um, I'm trying to, is it called? Mowgli. Um, yeah. yeah but, um, I can't remember the exact title of it. Uh, it is Mowgli. Yes. Uh, I'm really sorry. It was sure really bad. Yeah. yeah was incredibly powerful um, and I really enjoyed it and and it's something I really miss in lockdown is actually going to the cinema I, I really enjoy the act of going there sitting in a darkened room with a big screen I think it is fundamentally different from watching stuff at home uh, and I think there's some real beauty and magic in going to the cinema and the film I saw before that was uh, Rocks, Sarah Gavron's Rocks which was just joyous. I was laughing, I was crying. The performance was just so fresh and original uh, and, and a real, I think, landmark for British cinema. Um, I, I, you know, I, I never see stories like that on the screen and it was the same with Riz's film as well. Um, you just don't see that type of work and, and, and that's the thing, we should see that type of work and I think what's encouraging is that, that we are uh, and I feel that, you know, we're evolving at, at, at the moment and, and there's an audience uh, for those types of films uh, and it isn't a specific diverse audience, it's, it's everyone. And I think that's the key thing that people, the industry is, is twigging onto is that diverse work is, is authored by diverse people is for all. And I think that's really exciting and a real opportunity. So th those are the two films that um, I I've seen recently in the cinema. Mark? Well, <clears throat> it's killing me. I haven't been to the cinema since March and I can't bear it. Last film I saw was Misbehaviour, uh, which I loved. And I thought was a very, it was a very clever film because dressed up in quite an accessible, really quite fun, um, you know, tone. Uh, it scored some fantastic points. Obviously, there's, it's front and centre feminism, but there's a really interesting kind of intersectional aspect to it. And Gugu and Battle Raw's character is fantastically strong as well. And it sort of sneaks up on you. And I thought it was great, actually. Um, I think it would have had a really great uh, run at the cinema were it not for the pandemic, which was perfectly timed to kill it just after its publicity broke. Um, and it's killing me that I haven't been to the cinema since. I have to be careful for various reasons. So I'm not, I haven't been even in the bit when you could go and I can't bear it. Um, really terrible actually. Uh, but, you know, maybe we're not too far off being able to go back. Fingers crossed. And yeah, so on, was, yeah, go on. Oh, gosh. it was Mogul Mowgli, it was Basim Tariq's uh, film. Uh, which was which was brilliant and uh, really spoke to me as well. You know, coming from an Asian diaspora and and being second generation and parents having come over from India, um, uh, you know, and it's a film that explored partition and the effects of that and the movement of people and 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 what that has on the second generation and and it was really funny as well. There was there was loads of humour in it and life. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that. I think Riz is one of the greatest talents that we have in this country. Um, and, and obviously like many other young actors of, of color have, have had to go to the States. And I'm sure we'll talk about that later to achieve real, real success. And then, but what's good is hopefully they're, they're coming back and that there's more of an industry here for them now. Uh, and I think that is one of the biggest challenges we face at the moment. 
Yeah, Riz is an extraordinary talent who we've had the pleasure of working with at the festival with um, City of Tiny Lights a couple of years ago. Mm. Um, and prior to that, he did a little sketch for us just promoting what it means to be um, urban and a storyteller um, in this current British generation. Um, and obviously Riz has continued to excel in everything that he's done. He's obviously spoken in Parliament as well um, about diversity and representation and will cover that um, I'm sure um, as this discussion evolves but just to kind of stay on the theme of the pandemic how do you see the cinema industry coming out of this in 2021 obviously we've had the announcement of the tears um, and the lockdown and I know various sections of the cinema industry are literally pulling their hairs out just trying to work out what it all means um, for their businesses for staff and obviously for filmmakers and distributors at large. I mean, with your kind of producing hat on, how, how does it all look next year? Well, maybe I should start. I've got some hair left, actually, uh, rather than Mark. Um, Just. It's been, it's been, it's been, I'm actually losing it. <laughs> it's been incredibly tough uh, for the cinema and all the people. There's a huge amount of people who work in the cinemas as well. And I really feel for all the staff and, and the people who who put it on and I've been going recently just before the lockdown I would go every week to different cinemas to support the cinema and the the safeguards that the staff had put on and the welcome I'd received was incredible and um I, you know I find it very moving actually um it, it's it's very sad that you know we are under such stress that the the, the the cinema business, as a, as a, I'm talking about the exhibition of movies, not not the production of movies, which is which is starting again and and it's it's happening, um, and you know it's under great threat. But I, I think it's resilient and it will bounce back. It will just bounce back in a, I think a slightly different way. I mean that the economics and the way movies are being made and distributed and exhibiting is 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 changing in terms of you know. There's no point hiding from it that the streamers, people are showing movies in different ways and, and audiences are consuming them in different ways. But there, there always will be the magic of the cinema. Uh, and I think there will be an audience, an appetite for it. Uh, and I don't just mean the big tentpole Star Wars popcorn movies. I think, you know, recently the two films that I've seen, Mogul Mowgli and, and, and Rocks, uh, even though Rocks, interestingly, the, the night after I watched Rocks, it was on Netflix, but I was really glad that I watched it in the cinema. I think it's amazing it's on Netflix and I really applaud that and it will get a huge audience and I'm really glad of that. But there's something special for me of seeing Rocks on the big screen in a room with no interruptions. There is that communion you have with the silver screen. There's something really special and magical and as a filmmaker myself you know there are certain certain movies or films that you want to be seen you want to make and you want them to be seen on on the big screen uh, as well um but at the same time i, I think it is it, it, it's exciting that more people are going to watch films particularly cinema documentaries are being consumed in a huge amount on the streamers on different platforms so i think i do think that's a really that is a really that's a really great thing as well but but it's a really tough time and i think we all need to work together um for when cinema when it comes back to support it it needs nourishing it needs we need to go there obviously people need to feel safe and it needs to be safe to go with the pandemic but with a vaccine on the on the horizon at some point next year, I would hope that you know there's some more normality to cinema and theatre going, which is also crucial. Lots of cinema and television comes from the theatre, uh, and lots of our filmmakers have come from the theatre as well, and and writers and and performers. And so we need to also nurture that. It's that live experience of going to a room, going to a hall or a cinema or a theatre and, and, and watching things together. There's, there's nothing like it, I think. Mark? Well, I could paint a picture that 
I don't think I'm a crazy optimist, but I do think actually there could be something wonderful here, which is that I think, I hope the vaccines are going to change everything and the other treatments. And let's say by the summer of next year, you know, we might have a very different picture. And, you know, if ever there was a, I think that it, I think it's quite true that you never really miss something until, you know, you don't have it available anymore. And then I think a lot of people have thought, well, you know, I really, I can't bear not going to the cinema or, or theatre actually, gigs and the rest. And I think what we might find is a really quite hefty revival. You know, they're all still there just about. The, the circuits have just about arranged their finances so that they can survive and get through. And that actually quite rapidly, I think we might find that not only do people start coming back with a real vengeance to seeing stuff in cinemas, but kind of everyone remembers how much they love it and how much they value it um, and support it even more than they did before. Also, there will be a hell of a lot of films because, you know, first of all, so many films have been held over. And secondly, uh, production has continued because, you know, it's possible to produce stuff. It's difficult, but it's not impossible. So there's going to be a fair amount of stuff. I think it might be a slightly quieter year the following year because the production you know, is down, obviously, a bit. Uh, but I think that there will be a hell of a lot of stuff to come out. So maybe we're, we're heading for a really amazing summer onwards you know, of a revival of cinema going. And God knows, I hope that's true. So fairly positive from, from both of what you're saying there. Um, Chris, if I can kind of start with you uh, with regards to your tenure as BAFTA chair, which is six months into the post, I believe. And then prior to that, you were deputy chairman last year. And then from 2015 to 2019, you served as chair as the BAFTA television committee chairperson. Um, what have you learned about yourself and of the BAFTA organization over these past six months? Well, it's yeah, it's been a 15 year journey for me at BAFTA. I was involved from 2005 on the Learning and Events Committee, and then I was elected to the TV committee then in 2006. So I've kind of grown within the organization, obviously, as a person of color. Um, you know, I'm the first person of colour who's who's chaired BAFTA or, or chaired, I think, one of the main sector committees, film, TV or or, or games um, in its 73 year history. So, um, you know, I, I come with a different background and, you know, I was never the likeliest candidate. I mean, when I grew up, none of my family worked in film or TV and none of our community, which was Bengali, um, you know, worked in film or TV, so I didn't know anyone, and there was no one like me on TV or in the in the cinema. So, so I've always been some form of outsider. Um, but obviously, having been in an organisation for fifteen years and and kind of grown with it, obviously, I'm a, a producer in my day job. So I, I, I've been making you know films and, and TV programmes for, for for a long time, but um, I'm an outsider who's kind of become an insider and, and it's interesting and I think in the last six months it's been particularly acute because of the pandemic. I mean, it's changed the whole world. So I think all of us have had to look within ourselves. We've had time at home <laughs> to think and I think the horrific killing of George Floyd sparked something off you know, has really changed the Black Lives, uh, 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 you know, matters movement has, has, has really resonated around the world, partly, I think, because of the pandemic. I mean, there've been countless black people who've been killed, um, you know, at the hands of the police and, and others in America, but and, and others that have been filmed doing that. But it's this one horrific case that, has resonated more. And I think that's partly because of the pandemic. It's made us reassess who we are and a kind of attitudes in within society um, and given us time to think about that and given us time to get angry and given us time. I, th I think this has been the biggest kind of shift culturally since the civil rights movement 
And I think there's something genuinely happening around the world that obviously the flames of it were slightly earlier this year, but the key thing for me and what I've learned is what is it we do next? How do we continue this? What, what's the next phase of this? This can't be another flash in the pan. We've had too many of those. I've met too many people who are, who are cynical about, about change in, in terms of diversity and representation, particularly in the screen industries. But I do feel that this time is different. I feel this time people are listening, people are acting, uh, and there's a real movement of, of, of people and a coalition of allies that, that can, can make change wholesale, systemic and sustainable. That is the key thing for me. But the thing I've learned in, in the last six months is you have to have incredible focus, laser focus to make real impact. And, and I think what has been amazing about my time as chair coincided with the pandemic and Black Lives Matter movement and, um, and hopefully we with the BAFTA review, the 2020 review, where we spoke to well over 400 people, yourself included, different practitioners and people around the industry. It was an incredible focus group almost to, to, to have feedback about where we're at about these issues, what what we've done wrong, which I think we've we've come out and said things haven't been right in the past. We're trying to correct that. And and the thing that people like Mark, myself, and there are many, many great people in in I think in BAFTA who who are trying to achieve change. We're trying to clean up our own side of the street first, which I think we are doing. But then I feel we could really be a leader within the industry to set best practice, to kind of drive through change. If, if later on, Mark will talk about, you know, the, the BFI diversity standards and the film awards and how a number of things that we're, we're actively doing that can push through change, you know, and we do a huge amount of talent schemes and not just new talent, we do BAFTA Elevate, which I think is one of the best schemes around, which isn't for newcomers. That's for people who are quite high up in the industry, but just haven't broken through that, that glass ceiling. Uh, and we take people from underrepresented groups and we, we lavish contacts, um, masterclasses, meetings, anything they need to make that step up. And this year we've got actors and the first year we had female directors. And, and I think it's one of the best things that we do. I mean, that's the genius of BAFTA is we have access to world-class talent. So what we can do is shine a spotlight on certain people like BAFTA Breakthrough this year. If you look at the list of people who are selected for Breakthrough, I mean, it's incredibly diverse, but they're, they're not there because they're diverse. They're there because they're, they're the talent. And what we're doing is shining our spotlight. And I think... I mean, it's a tremendous privilege and, and a responsibility to do what we do. Uh, and I know it will go really quickly. People always say that. Um, and I feel really humbled to have started with the review because Mark and I listened to well over 400 people share some very powerful testimony and stories and experiences. There were a number of times we both, in fact, everyone, on the calls, we were doing them on Zoom, kind of broke down and cried and wept. Um, and, you know, we spoke to a lot of people from underrepresented groups, not just people of colour or female directors, we spoke to disabled creatives and filmmakers and actors. Uh, and I have to say, that was one of the things I really acutely felt and, and, and the couple of nights I didn't sleep was after those calls. Because sometimes people of colour you know, we might have felt ostracised or, or, you know, felt prejudiced, but the disabled, our disabled brothers and sisters, I mean, they have it incredibly tough, that they're, they're even more invisible than, than some of the other underrepresented groups out there. So it, it's been a hugely humbling and learning experience in the, in the first six months that's really, I think, fundamentally changed me as a person because... 
I feel I've I've learned so much from listening to people. And what's great is it's really fired me and the whole team up at BAFTA to drive through change. Um, and change needed to happen, not just at BAFTA, but it needs to happen within the industry. And, and the other thing I've learned is you need people at the very top of the organization. I chair the board of trustees at BAFTA. You know, I have a big say in what happens. So I feel that we need leaders in the industry who don't all look the same, who have different backgrounds and experiences, you know, at boardroom level, people, people with power and authority um, at the very top of organisations, and then the people who commission, the people who, are, uh, who hold the purse strings. We need people from different backgrounds at, at, on, at that table. Otherwise, I feel real change, it's, it's, it's more difficult to happen I do feel we have incredible allies. I have to say, I could not have done any of this without um, Mark, who has been an incredible ally to us all <laughs> who come from underrepresented groups. You know, you might say Mark is an older white guy, but he has fought with us side by side. Last, last time I, think, I checked, he was. Yeah, yeah. No, but he, he's white. A, it's just the older. He's a, but don't worry, he's a brother. He's with us. He's he's. He's one of us. So I think that's the key thing is we need allies. We need allies to achieve change as well. But but that's what the other one of the things I is, is I was just going back to you, you need people at the very top of of the industry to change because the people who run the industry all you know, a lot of them look the same or come from similar backgrounds. And it's also social diversity in terms of upbringing and backgrounds and and people who come from less wealthy backgrounds um i think that's really crucial in terms of where people come from as well if you've had a different experience you just have a different take on the world and you understand audiences as well it's just so i've i've learned a lot in the first six months and um i've got three years as chair and I want to see through and drive through lots of change. And as I said, I want to, you know, I feel like we're changing the whole of BAFTA culturally. It's not just we've made, we've announced over 125 changes in the film awards and a whole raft of changes in the TV awards. We're having a games review at the moment. We do video games, so we're, we're doing that. But also we're, we're in membership, we're inviting over a thousand new members from underrepresented groups over the next year and a half. Um, so we're radically changing the membership, but also I've challenged the executive that the staff of BAFTA, you know, diversity is something that we're seeing, not just the awards and membership. It's almost a prism by which we see everything now. And I think that's really, important and when it comes to the awards the key thing that we try to do is not some form of positive discrimination it's more what we've been trying to do is level the playing field because it hasn't been level for a long time and the issue is it's not one specific thing it's not oh it's your members who vote it's not that it's not just that it's also what's entered what's commissioned what's made what's marketed what's pushed, what's reviewed. So it's a real delicate ecosystem that many people are involved. And so what we've tried to do is engage with all of them, including the media and the press and the critics and say, why do you always cover these films? Or, you know, and obviously they, they have a responsibility to their editors and their buyers, they sell magazines or or newspapers and, and, and or clicks on the internet. So you need stars. And so it's the whole system that needs to change. And BAFTA sometimes is unfairly, I would say, a lightning rod for criticism, you know, with a punch bag. Whereas actually we're at the end of say the award season, <laughs> we're judging what's entered and what's, you know, and what's pushed. But what we've been trying to do is tackle it in all the different areas, campaigning, membership, voting. And so I feel by making those initial, and I mean initial 125 changes because there'll be more changes. This is not 
we haven't finished. This is just the start. And I think that's important to, to kind of say as well. We've had this, you know, we had this months and months of consultation where we listened and then we debated and now we've acted, but that's just the start. And I think it's, you know, it, it's really important. I mean, one of the things is, is the British Urban Film Festival is now a qualifying BAFTA festival for the Short Film Award. I think that that's, you know, a huge thing. We're, we're, we're really honoured that it's great that you're involved now and films that were entered here and now qualify for the Film Awards, for the BAFTA Film Awards, you can enter. And I think, I think that's, that, that's a really huge thing and an important thing. Um, and it's great to, sorry, I should have said at the beginning, it's really great to be here. Um, Mark, it's really important for I. We're, we're very grateful we were invited because we want to engage um, with festivals like this. It's, it's hugely important. Um, we can't just speak to the same people. We need to widen our net and reach different audiences. Sure, Mark, do you want to, you want to come in there? Yeah, I mean, the original question, I think, was what have you learned, wasn't it? Indeed. Sorry, I just went off piece there. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's fine. I mean, I could start by just saying, you know, what he said. So he's down there on my screen. You know, uh, we've, we've worked very, very closely on all of this, and we see these, these things very, very similarly. Um, I mean, I've, I've found it an extraordinary year, and it's very weird to say it, but you know, the worst year for so many people, you know, so many sick people, so many people's businesses ruined and the rest of it. It's, it seems amazing to think that there was anything good, good going on, you know, but actually the timing of it was very interesting. I feel that I think quite a lot of people within BAFTA, I think the truth is that quite a lot of people within BAFTA thought that inroads were being made <clears throat> on the underrepresentation in the industry over the last few years. You know, the whole, we just talk about the diversity standards, but, you know, BAFTA started in on diversity standards about three years ago, you know, did a pilot year, started to, you know, weave them in to being a, a need to qualify for them in order to qualify for some of the awards. <clears throat> so it wasn't like nobody was aware that there were issues out there. Of course that they were. And I think one of the things that tends to happen is that you've got some unbelievably brilliant uh, uh, on camera, you know, actors who get some awards and it kind of takes your eye off the ball. You think, oh, okay, this is, you know, Steve McQueen, arguably our greatest current director, um, certainly small acts, you know, would tend to support that. He's got two, BAF he's won two BAFTA awards, you know, he's just been nominated, he's won. So I think quite a lot of people who politically would feel this was an issue would have had their eyes slightly taken off the ball thinking, well, progress is being made, right? You know, I now know a lot more and I know that, uh, so anyway, so I suppose what happened was that in January when the nominations were announced, there were no female directors and there were no people of color among the acting nominations. <clears throat> and I think we all felt shocked and just a real sense of what the hell's going on here? You know, there were some great performances this year. What's happened here? And in a way, if there had been, I don't know, two people of color nominated, we might have all just continued to have our eye off the ball, you know, because you sort of think, oh, okay, that's sort of coming along okay. So in a weird way, I hope it'll be a shock that provokes change and makes some real profound stuff happen because one of the things that I'm very interested in is the fact that actually there are a lot of, I think it's unarguable, we have a lot of movie and TV stars who are non-white. There's no question about it. And they're amazingly brilliant. But actually the crew are so non-diverse. People behind camera, that's a huge issue and a huge problem. And obviously there've been many, many training schemes and you know, interventions that have been made. And there are more and more people coming in kind of at the training level, the entry level. But, you know, where are the leaders? Where are the heads of department? Where are the mid-level people? 
Um, and I think it's partly down to what David Orsoga described brilliantly, which is this sort of lost generation of people who were coming through and then have left the industry because they were so frustrated at their lack of progress. And their lack of progress was incredibly disproportionate, you know, to people who are non-white. What's that about? You can draw your own conclusions. That seems to me to be something that's very wrong with the industry. So when the awards, when the nominations came out, the people within BAFTA who are actually pretty like-minded, there are a lot of people, let's shall we say, incredibly disappointed, would be the very polite way of putting it. And there was there was a shock ran right through the organization, I would say. And I, I remember on the day, I had to be very careful because, you know, you have to be quite, you have to not be too emotional about how you react to things like that. But I think I did say I found that I was, I was infuriated. And it was how I felt because I just couldn't understand why, you know, we could list all the great noms, uh, all the great performances that should have had noms, you know. I don't know, let's not do it, but we know who, what they were last year. So that's weird that none of them got through. What's going on? You know. Just on that, Mark, just on yeah, that, please. something that's always I found fascinating to just kind of learn more about is it felt at the time that you were not in control of the situation when clearly as a committee that decides the nominations, you would like to think that you are always in control as to who would get nominated, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously there was a lot of um, comments about the fact that certain people were overlooked. There were also decisions that BAFTA or other people had made with regards to talent in terms of performing or being asked to present awards, et cetera, et cetera. Do, do you understand that frustration? I do, I do but, but some of that is just <clears throat> kind of factual clarity. So the, it's not a committee that decides, it's 6,700 members who vote. And, what we spent our time doing in the review was to work out what's going on here. You know, our, you know, it would be ridiculous, I believe, to say, oh, well, you know, BAFTA members are racist. I don't believe that. I really don't believe, oh, I'm sure there may, may be one or two, but generally speaking, they're a very connected, very committed, smart bunch of people. So you've got to wonder what is going on. And I think that listening to what 400 people had to say over the course of the first half of this year was completely fascinating and frankly educational and in a way the changes that we've come up with you know they're quite technical but the intention is to make the true intentions of the members land at the nominations because there are a lot of reasons why that wasn't happening start with there's 200 films to watch and in a quite short time. So the first thing that happens is, you know, how, how many people watch all 200 films? Answer, very few, because it's literally not possible. There are a lot of dedicated people, by the way, who watch well over 100 or 150, but anyway, generally speaking, it's very hard. And by the way, if you're shooting crew, you know, if you're, on, if you're making stuff, it's incredibly hard because you're working 12, 16 hour days, okay? So, What's going on there? That's the first problem. And then it's a question of, okay, so which films are they watching? Are they watching the films? And I think the conclusions that we reached were, they're watching the films that are the biggest and the most promoted, which does not necessarily mean the best and the most worthy films. So the changes that we've made are a lot of quite technical interventions to make absolutely sure that films are getting their best shot and they don't have to have a massive marketing campaign behind them <clears throat> to get their work their way all the way through. I mean, and I can go into it in detail, but it, I don't know how interesting it really would be for viewers, but we're going to make absolutely, we're going to do our very best to be clever and work our way around that. And there's a, all sorts of different interventions, structures, an extra round of voting, juries, um, additions to shortlists, uh, conscious voting videos that all members have to see. And very importantly, you can't vote at all in round two unless you've watched every film that's been shortlisted or longlisted for that round. That's, that's, I think that's the single biggest thing. 
Um, because, you know, there are a lot of films and what drove me insane afterwards was the number of people who said, oh, I saw, I don't know, name a film, Queen and Slim, uh, Cynthia Revo, you know, any of those things that people talked about, Just Mercy would be another one. Yeah, it's really, it's amazing. And I just, you know, I haven't got around to seeing it. Right? Mark, and that's the thing. Well, Get those films seen sure. and they have their shot. I was just going to mention Blue Story because yeah. although I did kind of single that out, the point I'm trying to make with regards to Black British directors is that there are very few of them. So when they do come out with a theatrical release, and obviously everything that was behind Blue Story in terms of the BBC Films involvement and people like Damien Jones, who himself was one of BAFTA. Um, how do you ensure in future that films like a Blue Story or films with a Black British director involved, uh, that they're not missed in the early well, part of the process? That, <clears throat> that film in particular, what was very interesting about that was that actually I think that a lot of people did see it because it went through the debut jury process which is a very careful process where a, a, a lot of people have to have seen it who are then part of that decision. And I actually think, I mean, I've heard a lot of people who, notwithstanding the cultural impact of the film, which was completely amazing, and, and frankly, the box office, which was great, um, but there are quite a lot of people that think, you know, they're mixed on how great a film it is. Sure. It's a different thing to, is it an important film? Because of course it's an important film. And I think that then on its merits, it didn't get through, but I'm less concerned about the process on that film. I mean, look, there's always gonna be films which you, you know, any individual would look at and say, well, I don't know why they put in that one instead of that one, right? It's subjective. And we try and get as close to objective as possible by being as smart about the structures as possible. But I think on that particular film, I think that that did go through quite a good process and it didn't get through, I would say on merit, which you feel free to disagree with because God knows the filmmakers might say that. And I, in fact, might say that myself, but I think that it did get a fair crack. Um, it's just odd. It feels odd because the profile of the film was massive and it somehow didn't get a showing. Having said all of that, you know, well, we'll see what the effect is this year. Of course, by the way, we've made all these changes and we're now coming into a totally aberrational year. So I don't know what we're going to get this year because yeah. it, well, you just know the releases have been crazy all over the place. And we're trying to include as many films as possible. And we've pushed the awards back, you know, from February to April. And we've pushed the qualification date right back to the very last possible moment. So as to get as many of the films in as possible. So I think to really judge it, you'd have to take it over the next two, three years and just yeah. see whether, <clears throat> whether things have settled. I, I agree. You have to look at 2021 in a completely different light because of the pandemic and the release <clears throat> pattern of movies, what films have been made this year. It's, it's difficult. And people do say that it's a worry for underrepresented groups, um, female directors, people of colour, disabled filmmakers, people from less wealthy backgrounds might struggle to get films and programmes made and, and, and whether the pandemic has disproportionately affected those very groups that we're trying to shine a, a light on. So I do think 2021 is going to be an odd year in terms of, it's just different. So I, I do think, as Mark said, look at 2021, 22, 23, uh, uh, to see the, the changes that, that we're making to level the playing field. Now, Mark mentioned, um, sorry, Mark, so I was just going to say, uh, Mark mentioned Chris, um, Sir Steve McQueen, um, with regards to his answer. Now, obviously, as you two are both aware, Steve made some comments um, at the time of the lack of um, diverse nominations. And he said, and I quote, with the BAFTAs, if filmmakers are not recognised visually in our culture, well, what's the bloody point? It becomes irrelevant, redundant, and of no interest or importance, end of. So when you have someone like Sir Steve making those comments, um, was there a natural kind of defense mode we need to go into here? Was he right? Or was he justified? Was it harsh? And did you kind of jump on the bandwagon of what Sir Steve said? I know, Chris, you said earlier on that 
Bath, BAFTA was already starting the process of yeah I mean changing I mean listen the- yeah I mean I listen I don't disagree with Steve at all I agree with all his sentiments but we we had already announced on the morning as Mark said of of the nominations that we were going to do a full and thorough review of all of our processes in our BAFTA and and as you've seen we have I think we've more than carried that out so so I think it, it it's not right to characterize that that we jumped on a bandwagon or reacted to what Sir Steve said Sir Steve is is one of our finest filmmakers no doubt uh, hugely respective I, I I personally love his work um and you know he's hugely important and influential in terms of British filmmakers on a global world stage. I mean, he's an Oscar-winning and and double BAFTA-winning filmmaker, uh, actually. So we have, you know, shone a light on his work, particularly earlier in his career as well. Um, so I, I think it's it, it's not right to say we we just reacted to what um, Sir Steve said, but we reacted to certainly the the, the nominations. Uh, uh, and also, I have to say, there has been a lot of work that's been done. BAFTA didn't just start doing diversity work on diversity this year. It's been going on for a number of years. And people like Pippa Harris, who was the chair before me, is, you know, did brilliant strides. And I, I, I think it's really important to, to recognise the good work that's been done. I think one of the things about BAFTA is a huge amount of great work is done. We are a charity. We are an academy, yes, but we are a charity and we do a huge amount of, of good work that impacts society and, and the industry that people just don't know about. And I think what one of the key things that I'm really keen to do is, is to communicate better with, with our members, with the industry, with the public about the good work that we do that's not the awards because we work 365 days of the year throughout the year. But obviously the film awards, the TV awards, the games awards are our big shop window or, you know, when the whole world is watching, but we do lo- loads of other great schemes, initiatives, masterclasses, events um, that, that have an impact uh, I think, I, think it's, I think it's true that and you're right, Krish, and it's it's we've got to that's one of the things we've definitely got to fix, which is people I mean BAFTA pays for a dozen people to go to film school every year. You know, that's pretty cool. And they're obviously have, as you can imagine, a very heavily diverse bunch. So BAFTA's raised money, set up funds, pays for that. Because it's a massive problem, isn't it? Film school's really expensive. You know, you don't get um you don't get any uh other help, you know, most people can't get any other help. So they literally, unless you're, you know, upper middle class, but unless you're from some money, you can't go. And that has blocked a lot of people. So that's one of the things BAFTA can do. And that's every year. And it's a very direct intervention. And it's quite a lot of money, actually. But like, did you even know that, Emmanuel? I didn't, no, I didn't. But, but, you know, but there's yeah. lots of other... Lots of loads other. of other things. Yeah, lots yeah, of yeah, other... Yeah. But I'm... And that's... To be honest, that those are the things that drive me on and want to be part of an academy and makes me really feel very proud to lead a charity like BAFTA. But the world, it seems, lots of people don't know about that work that 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 has a real positive influence um, in the industry and society. So just going back to your question, I, I you know I agree with Sir Steve. We've all agreed and said it's not right that there's been an imbalance in terms of representation and also the spotlight that is shone on work from and, and starring people from underrepresented groups. That is a major problem that, you know, is shown up in award ceremonies, but is a, in, a problem in industry, but also society. We know that there's racism, sexism, you know, lots of prejudice out there and there's always been but now it's being talked about it's being called out and we're trying to root it out and I think in one of my first letters to the members which was picked up by all the trades I said we've all got to do the hard work of 
really looking within our all our organizations our workplaces and root out the prejudice and racism and it's not about verbal attacks lots of this stuff is microaggressions i mean you know what it's like if you're the only person of color in a room or you're the only woman around a table in a meeting or you're the only you know the disabled person you know what that's like and, and that has pressure within itself and that has stopped people progressing you know through uh, up the ladder of, of of work and and to reach the higher echelons of of the industry and and there's there's just been too many imbalances for too long but what we're trying to do is is level that playing field to to remove some of those barriers um and, and I think we absolutely I think we are doing that um, we've still got a long way to go and as I said it, this is just the start of of our work it's it's not you know we're not patting ourselves on the back saying well we've made 125 changes in the film awards we're having a thousand new members you know that is compared to what what's happened in the past that is obviously like a tsunami of change but that's just the beginning because because there's a huge amount of work to be done but again, it's all of us have a responsibility within the industry to look in within, within ourselves and in our own working practices. One of the great things about BAFTA is within our membership, we have, I think, is it, I think, eight and a half, over eight and a half thousand global members, some in the States and some in other countries. Um, it's really important that we have people who are industry leaders within the membership. So when we write to them, we're actually talking to a lot of the industry as well as our members. So we have a huge responsibility um, and we can, you know, we can wield influence. And I think that is what we're trying to do. And BAFTA is a place where the industry can come together. We're not a trade union. We're not an industry body like that. There are brilliant organisations like Directors UK or the Writers Guild who represent equity for actors. And we're, you know, during the review, we reached out and we started saying, how can we tackle this problem, um, you know, about diversity and representation? And what's great is people want to come together. So we're working with all those different groups and organizations because there's a common goal here. And so it's really exciting. BAFTA can be a place where people can come together um, you know, and look at best practice. And, so if, you, and if, you, if you said, just to pick up on that, Chris, sorry to interrupt you, but if you think about it, you know, who does BAFTA represent, right? It, it's, it's everyone, it's no one faction. And in a way, it means it's, it's kind of got to think very clearly about its purpose because, you know, if you represent actors, you represent actors, your equity, that's what you do, right? It's quite straightforward everything that's in the best interest of actors. There you go. Whereas BAFTA is slightly different because it's representing everybody and it's representing the industries. And it has a responsibility because it has this extraordinarily high profile for whatever reasons, historic or whatever. So you have to turn that combination into a force for good. And for me, what it's all about is, you know, we're all volunteers. I mean, none of us get paid. We're, we're committee members. There's probably 70 Krish committee members across all the different BAFTA groups. All volunteers, no, no one's paid. Everybody was, wants to make the industry better. And that's what it's for. Make the industry better, make it better. And then maybe that then makes the world a bit, a bit better because you know it's quite an influential and powerful and significant industry in that way. So. It's, it's a very worthy thing to do. And if you come at it with a moral position, which is, for example, you know, you look at a film set or you look at the list of people nominated for acting BAFTAs and you think, well, that doesn't look like the world. You know, you're looking at a film set in London and think that doesn't look anything like London. So what are you gonna do about it? Well, you know, we're not politicians. We're not, you know, we don't, we can just do the bit that we can do, but you can use this, very good organization to try and just nudge everything a bit you know it's not going to solve anything it doesn't commission any films 
all it can do is use its influence in every way, everything it touches, try and move everything along a bit and make the industry a bit better, make a good contribution, you know, let the industry become the shining light for inclusion, you know, in a very few years, let it be just not an issue that anyone talks about anymore because you just don't need to, because it's just looks very diverse in every way, right? And then let BAFTA within the industry be a leading light in the industry. So, you know, gradually get BAFTA to be an organization that you could look at and say, you know what, that's really good. That's actually, they've kind of got their shit together and it's everything. It's internal, it's the way the nominations work, it's who's the membership. It's It's gotta be absolutely every aspect. Everything you do has to have this in mind. And then you become an exemplar for everybody and it hopefully then leads the industry. Sure. Okay, we'll come back to BAFTA um, later on, but I just want to kind of change the discussion slightly to both of your actual day jobs, which are producers. Um, and I just wanted to start off by asking you with your producer's hat on, um, what appreciation do you have and continue to have for Black British cinema, which has been going for just over 40 years. So it's very kind of in its infancy, but obviously in that time, um, the UK has produced the likes of Steve McQueen, um, Amara Santi, Noel Clark, etc. There's not that many of them, but as producers, um, what appreciation do you have for what's come to be known as Black British film? Chris, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, as a producer of colour myself, and I run a production company, my day job with um, uh, a guy called Richard Yi, who's of Chinese heritage. So we're both people of color. So a lot of the work we do, we're, we're drawn to people who want to tell different stories. I've just made a film for Channel 4 uh, with Letitia Wright um, called I Am Danielle. And CJ Beckford starred in it as well, who's a terrific young actor. And again, um, I was on a call with Caroline Hollett, the, the, the head of Channel 4 Drama, and she was saying, he's a terrific young actor. Let's hope he doesn't go off to the States. He's, he stays here. She said that on a call with lots of producers this morning, which was great. And Letitia is one of our, I think, well, in the world, she's on the world stage. She's one of our finest actors that, that we have. So, you know, and, and I'm working with, writers like Stephen S. Thompson, who wrote the Sitting in Limbo, the Windrush drama, developing a big six part television series with him. And what's interesting about people like that is the stories that they have to tell. Um, I don't think of black stories as such. They obviously they have black characters at the heart of, of, of what they do, but but they're both universal those 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 projects that, that I'm doing and, and have done and um, that's the thing that's really interesting you you, you see work at, at, and people say oh is that black work or it's diverse work and it's like well you don't say that about white work it's it's work yes there are stories from a different point of view and with different authorship and people who've had different experiences but but Letitia's film is 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 about falling in love and about trust, and and buried is about the grief of, that a father has of their son, who's um, um, who's been killed um, in in knife crime. And I'm working with a, a brilliant young filmmaker called Aki Amashabi, who did Real, uh, the feature film, which I think was featured at this film festival last year. Um, he's developing a, a drama series for us um, set in a prosperity church in South London. Again, all the characters predominantly black. It's set in the black community, a church community. But, I, you know, when I look at, and um, we're going to make that, that will have an audience hopefully around the world. It's, it's a really funny, vibrant story. Um, and Aki is a wonderfully gifted filmmaker, writer, producer, director, actor, um, and you know, and if you look at the, the work that's being made now, people talk about Steve McQueen series and Michaela Cole's series, I May Destroy You, as the two 
television pieces of drama that probably the most authored work on British television today, and they're both from black creators. And yes, the subject matter, particularly in Steve's series, is is a black about the West Indian community in London. And and but Michaela's is about, you know, young woman. It's about a flawed young woman. And it's resonated beyond these shores with audiences. It's not niche work. Um, but yes, as a producer, I have a real appreciation for stories from people of colour and 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 I think like myself, being a filmmaker, we just have a different way of seeing the world because we've grown up with different experiences. That's all. And I think that enriches culture and society. And it's just, I find it really baffling for so many years that our stories have been locked out of mainstream television or, or film yeah. because they're really interesting, yeah. you know, and not just for us. It's just like the myth when Black Panther came out, the myth that black cinema for some reason doesn't, sell or make money that was that's just a myth yeah. you know and and so yeah sorry Mark. I was just gonna say that I feel like you know yeah black cinema or, or maybe you know widen the ethnicity the you know the under all the underrepresented groups you know has been waiting so many years to shove through and I can remember when I first got started that people like Isaac Julian and Melanie Shabazz and you know making really amazing stuff, totally unmainstreamed, you know. I think when Channel 4 got going, people forget that, you know, what Farouk Dondi did as the commissioning editor and what he started to get going, uh, what's it called, Bandung File, you know, there were all kinds of really interesting things that started happening, which felt extraordinary and esoteric, you know, and actually they were, even then they're representing, I don't know, a third of the population of London, significant proportion of the, the country, but just very little seen. Um, and it's been, there's been, it feels like there's been this kind of explosion that's been waiting to happen for a very long time. And we do see people, I mean, you know, you think about what, what Gurinder Chada has managed to achieve over the years uh, and had a whole career, you know, it's amazing because she had so little support and she had so many struggles and you know how many times must that woman have been told look you know it's just not it's just a minority sport you know what you want to do people aren't that interested and then you come out with bend it like beckham but also several of her other films glorious mainstream utterly acceptable to all wonderful films you know too many people gone to the states uh there are people who i uh i know well and who just had to do it, or it's not like they say, right, that's it, to hell with it, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving because you're terrible to me, but you know, they get an opportunity. I mean, Antonia Thomas would be a great example where this is a brilliant actress. She was you know, having a very successful career, misfits here, seen her on stage, you know, at the national, you know, she can do it all. And then uh, she gets this pilot for the something you know, an American series. And it's like, nah, you know, well, I, I probably won't get it and it probably won't get commissioned and all the rest. And it became the number one series. And there she's, so she's in Vancouver for, I don't know how long it's been now, four or five years, uh, you know, doing that thing, which is going to be amazing for her career in the long term. But it certainly means she isn't here doing this thing, you know, all the time. So okay. that has been, that's, yeah. that, I think that's been the experience. Sure. I just really hope that things are changing now. I was just going to kind of uh, name drop Antonia because we're showing one of her films at our festival this year, all on a summer's day. Um, right. People watching this um, after this event, do you check out our website to watch? That's great. Thank Antonia, you. Starling I think, Antonia Thomas I think she's. I think she is. She is one of the. Uh, she is one of the very best that we have. Also, she sings like an angel. Just by the way. Okay. I'll bet I might. <laughs> but um, so how? Oh, you touched on it, Chris. How how do we continue to cherish that authored work from black directors, black creators, people like Gurinder Chada? How do we cherish that going forward? And how do we bring more people through? I mean, to that extent, just from my kind of knowledge of black British cinema, there's only been six females um, in that kind of space 
that have actually theatrically released films. You can count them on the back of your hand, quite literally. I mean, why have there been so few? Ngozi Omura being the first, and my wife, incidentally, being the last, which is a couple of years ago. Yeah, I mean, Amara Sante is one of our finest filmmakers. She's, you know, she she's great. I mean, Steve McQueen, I think, when he won his first BAFTA, he said, his mum always said, it's twice as difficult for us. And she's right, he said. And I, I agree with him in terms of the thing that I want to say to commissioners is, yes, it's been great. We've had Steve McQueen and Michaela Cole's work but that is some of the best work in the country. Uh, and other people have a right to fail, get a second chance, get another opportunity. But the bar seems to be higher for producers, writers, directors of colour. And the other thing I'd like to say, and it's really important, is, you know, if you're a producer or director or writer of colour, you don't just have to write about that specific experience. If you're white, you can write about anything. And say, you know, 8% of work commissioned is diverse. You know, anyone can write. That's uh, like the rest of the, the 98% of the work. So it, I, I think it's really important that creators of colour or or other underrepresented groups are not ghettoized. It's really important that. And, you know, that needs some thinking about from commissioners, because I do feel at the moment, everyone understands and the need to commission much more diverse work, but that doesn't necessarily mean that diverse creators can't just do anything. Do you see what I mean? It's like, and what we don't want to live is, it, live in the stereotype of what a, a white commissioner's view of the world is it's actually you've got to talk to the creators and say what do you want to do and but not limit them and then not limit them to that eight percent of work i'm just making these figures up but do you see what i mean in terms of uh so we're at a very crucial time yes i feel on-screen representation has got better in the last few years yes but behind the camera is not good. And that is something BAFTA is working on as well and trying to bring the industry together with to, to, to change the dial of that, to have more people in senior positions or heads of department behind the camera, but also our creators, our writers, directors, and producers. It's really important to support and nurture um, all of those creatives. Because as Steve's mum said, <laughs> Um, it's twice as hard and we've got to have the right to fail. I think that's, that's, that's really important. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've got a question from one of our audience um, who's tuning in to watch this from Ashanti Omka. Um, and they've asked this question. I'd like to ask the panel how they intend to get diversity, BAFTA that is, into all levels of management and if they are planning to get diversity riders into the British filmmaking process. And if they will give enticing subsidies to films that have a certain percent, percentage commitment to diversity in terms of cast and crew. Um, they then go on to ask in terms of the term urban, which has been contended by many like the acronym BAME, is this something that is now too late to change considering the different layers of representation and diversity that exist in Britain today? So there's two questions there, so. Shall well, I just talk you? about the first, the first yeah, bit? Sure. Which is, okay, so BAFTA is the, an academy, it's the academy, right? BAFTA is the, the coming together in membership of what's at least theoretically is, you know, the most experienced practitioners in the industry, the people who have achieved the most. And that's what it is. It isn't, it doesn't commission films or TV shows or games. It doesn't control the commissioning of them. It doesn't set rules for that. It doesn't do any of those things. It has a very shiny moment, which is the, the awards, and it has a lot of influence. And it then does a ton of other, uh, uh, you know, learning and 
new talent and inclusion initiatives um, all the way through the year, but that's it. So it doesn't set the rules for what gets made. And all it can do is have an influence and, and speak as loud as it can. I think one of, and one of the things clearly that it can do is what, you know, highlight people. So people particularly, you know, from underrepresented groups can get a bigger profile and BAFTA can kind of push them and champion them. And that's, that's what it's there for. And it's a good thing, it's a great thing, but it doesn't make those rules. Interestingly, just with my producer hat on, I mean, it's a great question. And the real question that's sitting there is, you know, what's anyone doing about all of this? I think there's a massive problem in the British film industry, which is overrides, you know, it sits over all of this stuff, which is that the British film industry is pretty bombed out at the moment. You know, it's just got very, very little money. There's literally very few places to go to for money. I'm a producer, you know, if you said to me, list all the places to go to for money for films, it's a very short list and there's very little money there. The, the dominant places are the public funders, if you can call them that. So BFI, Film4 and BBC Films. And I would say that all three of them uh, have a huge commitment to inclusion in all, in all sorts of ways. You could probably, you know, you might disagree with some of their specific decisions, of course. But generally speaking, they're the people who are backing the new talent and they're backing people from underrepresented groups in all ways. So that's their job. I mean, it's public money, right? It's our money. That's what it's there for. Uh, they're not there to make a profit. They're, met, they're there to back, you know, it's a cultural intervention. But I think that's kind of working. And uh, not to say you wouldn't want to specifically disagree with them about certain decisions, but generally, I think that's there. <clears throat> In terms of who else is there, there are so few places that are made you're talking about very commercially minded companies, uh, distributors, international sales agents, but they have so little cash uh, that actually they tend to kind of congregate around some really major talent. And actually, if, they, if it'll make money, then, you know, they'll go for it. So for example, you know, we've mentioned Steve McQueen. I think if he just said, I'm thinking of doing this feature film, there'd be a, you know, a lot of people would say, you know, we're in. What, do you, what is it you want to do? And of course, the American studios will back people like that. You know, it isn't just Steve McQueen, you know, but that's kind of fairly established people. And then you've got this gap, which is all the people who are not really established, brilliantly talented. Where are they going to get backing from? And that's a massive problem. And that isn't a, an institutional racism problem. It's just that the whole industry is so tiny now. It's really very bombed out. You know, I and think there's is, a lot. Is that, is that a gap, Mark, that BAFTA can fill in terms of elevating those people to be visible to the finance? The problem is the finance itself is so small. There's so little of it. You know, I mean, if I said to you, Emmanuel, well, you're in the industry, you list for me all the, all the organisations that invest in British films, not public money, private money. It's a, it's a very small list. You're, you'll be groping for, you know, it's not like there's a ton of great people or great organizations out there. I think there's some real hope with Netflix and we'll see what Fiona Lamptey does for them. I think that's really exciting. And I think they'll do great work. But even they, I mean, how many films might they commission in a year, 10? You know, <clears throat> it's still very small. Everybody sort of forgets that late last year, 2019, the BFI's numbers came out and there had been a 50% reduction in the British independent film sector, 50%. So in a year, it just fell off a cliff. Uh, Brexit doesn't help. The tightening up of the tax uh, laws mean that various, you know, kind of tax-based investors, EIS, you know, a lot of that's gone. So that I think is a massive problem and that sits alongside you know, the, the, the issues of institutionalized racism or lack of inclusion, of course, but it's, it's really important to recognize that it's not a flourishing industry. It's a bombed out, very troubled industry, you know, for everybody. And yes, actually the thing about having to work twice as hard then really hits because it's terrible for everybody and probably twice as bad for, you know, people from the underrepresented groups. I, I totally acknowledge that, but it's still, for me, that's a massive factor. 
interestingly in television, which is where I really work now, uh, the networks are very powerful and basically it's they who commission. It's like you've got, it's like having the Hollywood studios, you know, the networks basically pay for all the TV production between them. And I'm being broad in the sense of who the networks are, everyone from the BBC to Netflix to Sky to, to I don't know, stars, you know, they make stuff here. They are actually very uh, serious about attending to issues of inclusion. You know, um, I'm working on a show with Sky. Sky, they send you, when you get going, your 50 pages of, of uh, information and stuff that they require. And it's all sorts of rules, and we need you to be a member of this organization. You have to do that, and we expect that. And there's a massive section, which is, and these are, these are who we expect to see in terms of the diversity of your crew. You know, we, do, we expect to see this, at least a minimum of this percentage of writers, you know, being female, being non-white. We need to see, you know, they, they absolutely lay it down. and All the networks are doing that one way or another. So I think in TV, things are on the move. And I think just to come back to trying to actually answer the question that was asked, um, those kinds of structures and rules and targets are, I think they're in in television. And I think the real problem in film is they're in with the public funders, but it's who are the private funders, you know? Where are they? Getting to bite, getting them to bite on it. It's very hard. Chris? I'm really sorry, I forgot what, it was such a long answer from Mark. <laughs> Briefly, well, you're, you're both guilty of long answers this afternoon. Really so sorry. I'm I think they're philosophical. But I guess the question was about diversity riders um, and in terms of uh, where the money is, I guess, in terms of... Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, it, short answer to that is BAFTA is not a funder. We, 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 we're not giving out the grants. But what we are doing, saying you can't enter these awards unless you hit these diversity targets, these standards in front and behind the camera. And that is actively driving so we do have a big stick and it is a deterrent and we are forcing people and people want to be in the awards people want the awards because you get a nomination it's it's more reclaim for your tv program video game or, or movie uh, and it's the best marketing ever and it obviously bestows kudos and also will will draw an audience to your film so having that gold standard of a BAFTA nomination or award is hugely influential. So by us saying, if you don't hit these diversity standards, you can't enter, that is a very forceful thing to do. And we started doing that a few years ago in the British categories and we're rolling them out. And now the Oscars are also about to take up those diversity standards. And the thing about the BFI diversity standards is yes, they are a framework we can ratchet them up. If we don't think they're strong enough, you know, all it is is a framework. I've seen all this criticism about it, but you're criticizing a framework. We can make it, we can move it, we can make it tougher. And, and the BFI and, and are reviewing been, it now. The BFI yeah, are so, so I do feel that we are doing something and we have to be vigilant about, is it having an impact? And, and so we're looking at all of that and we can ratchet it up um, if need be. So to answer that question, we're not a funder, but what we are doing is, is enforcing that there is some diversity in the production and it's genuinely moving things. People are hiring in different ways. Yeah. You have to get out of your comfort zone and sure. widen your network of people. I guess what so, part of the question... I guess part of the question, what Mark was trying to answer earlier was, does that lead to more finance being attracted, whether you win a BAFTA or the fact that yeah. people don't have to adhere oh. to diversity guidelines? The money's not there or not enough of it is there anyway, but with this, these frameworks in place, will it infinitely lead to more money being attracted to diverse productions? I think, I think, I think it will in the long term because more, hopefully more diverse creators and creatives and production teams will be working and therefore more, hopefully more work will have a sh spotlight shone on it. And as soon as you have some success, it's, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It, it, it generates more. So, 
so yes, I think so. And if you look at what, you know, there is a drive to commission more work from a different spectrum of people at the moment. So I think it's all feeding into that. So yes, but it, it does take a little time. Um, it sure does. Okay, um, we've got about 10 minutes left, gentlemen. So um, I've got a couple of questions that I wanted to get across to you. Um, we talked earlier about, uh, Chris, you mentioned the thousand new members from underrepresented backgrounds that you want to bring into BAFTA um, in the next year and a half. Um, to date, how many have you approached and what ultimately is the criteria for these new members to be part of BAFTA? Well, it, it, we're, we're not lowering any standards and I, I don't want people to think, oh, we're letting anyone in because what I don't want is people to think, oh, BAFTA's lowering their standards to let all sorts of people in. And it's like, I, I don't think that's the case. I think there are lots of people from underrepresented groups who are certainly good enough. There are finest actors, writers, directors in the country who just aren't members. Um, so I think we need to work harder to attract those people and invite them. And we're in the active process now of sending out, doing the research, sending out invitations. We've set up a future membership group um, to actively look year round, because once a year you can apply, I think in March is the deadline. You can apply any time of the year. And one of the things people don't know is, is people, I've spoken to a lot of people and said, are you a member? And they say no, and they go, we thought we had to be invited or we thought you had to be a winner. And it's like, no, anyone can apply. You need five years experience within the industry at a certain level, a grade. And what we're looking at though is, you know, we know that there have been barriers to people getting credits, say in film or TV, you know, it might be female directors. It might be people of color who don't get that chance. They might get a first film, but they might not get a second film. So they might have worked in short film or films for the web. So we just have to look harder. I wouldn't say there's still a standard. We still want the Academy to be people who've achieved something within the industry. That's really important. That's what an Academy is. So I don't want people to think, oh, we're letting anyone in, but we are letting anyone, anyone any background in. That's the key thing. You still yeah. have to have achieved something. And we do have new talent, like tiers and schemes, BAFTA crew. So if you've worked for a couple of years in the industry, you can be part of BAFTA in a slightly different way than being a full member, but you still get the networking and events. So there are we are trying to find a kind of talent pool and ladder up to full membership as well. But we're in the process of, of, of yeah. seeking out and inviting over a thousand new members from underrepresented groups. And yeah. it's not just people of colour. Yeah. It's also, you know, f female directors, uh, female <laughs> members, actually. Mm. We've, we've, we, you know, in, in a few months' time, we will publish for the first time ever um, our full um, diversity stats. We've sent a survey out, which we're in the process of collating. Uh, and so we're going to publish where we're at as Academy and we're also going to announce diversity targets. I mean, I think we know what they are, but what we wanted to check is where we're at at the moment. So the timeline of in 2021, we want to be here. 2022, we're going to be here. And obviously we want to achieve 50-50 male, female uh, and, you know, people of colour and disability. Um, you know, so we'll announce those in the next few months. And again, we've never done that publicly and, and that will stretch us and we'll be accountable to that. So I think that there's an air of transparency, which I think is really important. And we need to show people this is who we are. And also we can see where we're missing if we say, well, well, actually we really, you know, we're really missing disabled creatives and filmmakers um so you know we have to, to work harder the, sorry sorry chris just to be clear on the thousand new members so for each of those they would have to pay for the privilege of being uh, a member of bafta because there'll be people watching this that are not familiar with 
how to yeah so so each year so each year you can apply and you don't need someone to propose and second you a number of years ago we did away with that because in the past you had to have a current BAFTA member propose you and second you we we stopped that because we thought if we want to widen our talent pool if we want to widen our pool we might be going to people who don't know anyone who's in BAFTA so that shouldn't be a barrier. So we, we, we scrapped that a few years ago and people don't know about that. So anyone can apply. Have a look at our website in terms of the eligibility criteria. You need to have worked for at least five years at a certain level um, to, to qualify for BAFTA membership. And obviously lots of people apply. So not everyone gets in because we obviously we want the best people to get in. So every March, we then spend a few months going through the applications. But what we're doing is we're going to invite a certain number of people and we're aiming for a thousand over the next 18 months. And those new members will be from underrepresented groups and they will have a hefty discount because obviously there's annual membership subscriptions. You have, you know, you have to, you, you're a member of an academy. So you would have to pay those yearly subscriptions. Um, so it's, it's really important. We're also looking at having a lower fee for younger members because obviously we want to attract the younger generation as well. So we'll be announcing that um, shortly as well. And out but, of London. So you, out of London as well. And also if you're a disabled filmmaker or creative, that, that membership subscription will be lower as well. So all those things are in the process. We're working through all of those things. But if you're invited in the next year, um, that the fees will be significantly lower because obviously we want you to we want you to join uh, and experience BAFTA and stay and grow with us for the next 20, 30, 40 years. So it's 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 really important. And it's really important for people because some of the people I've spoken to said, Well, I didn't think it was for me, or there's not many people who look like me within BAFTA. So why would I join? And what what I want to say to you is it's really important that we have, we work with you, you're part of BAFTA, because my big thing, the reason why I got involved is you've got to be in it, within it, to really create change. I think it's very difficult to be on the outside, you know, shouting at the walls, whereas I thought, right, I'm going to get in that organisation, I'm going to work my way up to the top and then really infiltrate it and create change. Um, and I feel now I'm in a position to do that, but I need your help. I need everyone's help. I need more people from diverse backgrounds, from kind of less wealthy backgrounds, but, you know, disabled filmmakers, people of color, you know, women, you know, there's an imbalance. There's too many men at the moment. So, you know, women outnumber men on the planet. So <laughs> it's, there's no excuse nowadays. So, I would, you know, and, and there's huge benefits to be in part of the Academy, all the events that we do year round, the talks, the um, masterclasses, the screenings. Um, it, it, it's a real honour and privilege to be part of the Academy. But, but I think with the work we're doing, we can also create social change. Yes, we're the gold standard it's of, of the industry and excellence, and it, it's what BAFTA is, is, is a group of people at the top of the industry who, through peer-to-peer -peer review, we watch work and go, yes, this is the best film or performance this year. And that mark of excellence is, is really the pinnacle of the industry. And it has great, great kudos. And what we've seen in the past is, you know, certain sections of society weren't being recognised for a myriad of reasons we've discussed interconnecting and interlocking reasons there were barriers to you know diverse people being recognized and what we're trying to do is remove those barriers but we do need a more diverse membership that's undoubtedly it's one of the factors so we're really trying to say that please you know join us um be part of it and be part of the change Um, Mark, did you have anything to add there? No, because okay. it was such a long answer, I can't remember the question. <laughs> <laughs> He's right, naughty. Hopefully, hopefully the two He's of you naughty. are going to finish 
short answer to this very last question. Um, and obviously I'll take this opportunity as we're about to wrap up to thank you both for your time this afternoon. Um, obviously with it being um, the season of goodwill and all of that jazz, um, if you were asked to give a Christmas message to the film community, um, what would be uppermost in your thoughts? Um, and I know this is going to be hard, but if you can give me Mark. a short answer. Mark goes first. Yeah, oh, Mark. thanks, Chris. Yeah, great. thanks. It's got to be something along the lines of hang in there, guys. It's It's been such a hard year for so many people. It's going to get better, okay? It's, it's, it's going to get better. Good luck to everybody. Um, what a time people have had. You know, freelancers, it's just been shocking. I mean, how many people have we lost to the industry, you know? Because... They they have to pay their bills, you know. So I don't know, but I do think I do think we're over the worst. Chris, looks like you've got the last word. Yeah, my my mum always used to say, uh, "Health is wealth." So look after each other, look after the olds, and um, let's let's stick it out. Let's get through it, and we'll come back more resilient. Um, next year and on that oh, can i just say emmanuel oh, there was one thing oh. we didn't talk about um and i wanted to talk about early in my career i worked with darkest how i made yes. some films and documentaries for channel four and it was you know it was incredible to watch uh, steve mcqueen's film mangrove about the mangrove trial which darkest was a very big part of and i thought malachi kirby did a stunning performance uh, of playing the young darkest how he he captured the voice perfectly. But, you know, watching that film just reminded me I spent months and months and months working with Darkus on a couple of documentaries for Channel 4. One that launched my career and got me a BAFTA nomination, my first film, um, which was Who Are You Calling an N-Word? That was Darkus's title. Uh, and in those days, the N-Word was fully printed, which obviously uh, it wouldn't be now. Uh, uh, and it's a, a, an offensive word, but he... He reclaimed that word and used it. And it was a, a film about uh, inter-ethnic um, racism and prejudice. And um, it was, you know, really eye-opening. And I just wanted to say, I feel incredibly lucky to have, have worked with him, uh, an incredible campaigner. Uh, and I think at the time I was really young and I didn't fully appreciate what an amazing man he was and what, and, and and the battles that he fought. And he really influenced me in more ways that, than I realised at the time. And watching that film just, just made me realise how lucky as a young filmmaker to work with someone like him and look at issues about race and class uh, and society and who we were. Uh, and I kind of imbibed it all and I didn't kind of fully appreciate it. And watching that film the other night, I shed a, a tear uh, uh, and remembered all the times that we had together and all the things that he taught me that I didn't want to listen to at the time. I was young and impetuous and I was a filmmaker and, and Darkus would talk about the struggle uh, and, and the fight and this country and what it meant and what it meant to be black or Asian. Uh, and I just feel very lucky to to have done that and um, and really proud of the films that we made together and it kind of really said something and, and it launched my career um, uh, and I'm really grateful for that. Very well said, Chris, very well said. Um, gentlemen, um, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Um, hopefully we can do this again in 12 months time to see what progress BAFTA has made. Cool. Yeah, sure. Excellent. Krishnendu Majimda, Chair of BAFTA, Mark Samuelson, BAFTA Awards Committee Chair. Happy Christmas and a prosperous 2021 to you both. A healthy one. Thanks. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Yeah.